compares an akazo so that my household can be full. So when a principality brings government, you need another agent to compare people to come. You can build a church boy to be empty. When you come to the crusade ground or when you receive, heard the gospel, because of a lack of a better word, we, we say you are giving your life to Christ. But the truth is that you don't have a life to give. You are dead. Every one of us in sin, the Bible said we are dead. So when you accepted the truth of the gospel, you actually received the life of God. That's why John 3.16 said, For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So it was God who gave you life. You didn't have life to give to him. Do you follow? Now, after you receive the life of God, you become a child of God. But that's where the journey begins from. As a child of God, you are a bona fide member of the house of God. But you see, no child can do the, the biddings of the father. Even in our natural life, there, there are many things you would love your child to do, but he can't. He's a child. As simple as running errands, children can't do it. You give them money, go and buy clipper, they will come with big. You say, no, go back. It's, it's shaving big, I asked for. Not, they will now say, ah, I lost the money. That's a child. They can't even run around because they are children. So you have to mature before God can work with you. So from a child, you grow to become a son. It is a son that the father commits kingdom to. And we have taught extensively here on what it means to be a son. In fact, we had a talk show last week and we're dealing with the subject of maturity and i've taught you here severally that there are three major understandings that you must have if you will mature in the things of god the first was what paul taught us in hebrews chapter 6 from verse 1 to verse 3 he said therefore leaving the principles of the doctrines of christ let us go on to maturity not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works that's number one so he gave us six things that makes for maturity in the kingdom and he said number one is what laying repentance from dead works number two he said faith towards god number three he said doctrine of baptisms number four he said laying on of hands number five he talked about resurrection from the dead and number six he spoke about eternal judgment paul said these are basic things you should understand if you want to come into maturity and we have taught it here before that dead works are works that are not inspired by the holy ghost rather they are inspired by the flesh because you want to to gain the applause of men or you want to present yourself in a certain way so paul said if we want to grow we must repent turn away from such things our pursuit should not be vain glory our pursuit should be that god is glorified and then he went further and spoke about the second one which is faith towards god so paul is telling us that to grow we must learn to put our trust in god not on things not on people because you discover that there are many christians today they trust the government or their employers more than god they trust the doctor more than god they trust weather and nature more than god so paul is saying if your plan is to grow in god when you repent from dead works he said the second thing you must learn is to put your trust in god above all else and then he went to the, the third thing he spoke about the doctrine of baptism and we have taught you the, the four major types of baptism in this house i showed you water baptism which denotes separation from the world that means you no longer have a place in the world you may be a drunk before you may be a fornicator before but when you come into the fold you no longer have a seat in the beer parlor because that water baptism is a sign of separation from the world and then i told you about baptism into the body which is actually the act of receiving the life of god and becoming a member of the body of christ and then i spoke about the baptism in the holy ghost which is where you receive empowerment to do the work of god and then i spoke about baptism of fire where you endure afflictions for the sake of jesus christ paul said if you will mature you must have all of these dimensions of baptism separated from the world 
separated into the body of christ empowered by the holy ghost to do the work of god and enduring affliction for the sake of jesus he went further to speak about the laying on of hands and i taught you about the laying on of hands it's a system of the kingdom where spiritual resources virtues are transferred from one to the other and you will see that as you are growing in the things of god there are those who will be ahead of you who will have more capacity than you again and again they will need to strengthen you so that you don't fail this is why paul was speaking in galatians i think chapter 4 verse 2 and he said we should bear one another's burden and so we fulfill the law of christ so one of the ways we bear burdens is that we lay hands on people people who are struggling with issues sometimes when you lay hands on them those issues die people who need to grow fast when you lay hands on them it accelerates their processes people who need dimensions of graces and giftings when we lay hands on them we transfer it so he said you must understand that this is a mystery in the body of christ because it will help your growth process and he didn't stop there okay galatians 6 2 he didn't stop there he went further to the fourth he spoke about the resurrection from the dead that is where you come into the new life that is in christ jesus because the animal life cannot sponsor your work with god the animal life cannot give you victory in life so paul is saying you must believe in the immortality of jesus so the whole idea behind faith in christ that christ rose from the dead is an assurance that you have that death will no longer hold you captive so after this life there is hope for you and that life that christ resurrected with is what you now receive so you can no longer be defeated so even if a christian were knocked down he will not lie down there and say it's over he knows that there is something on his inside that makes him not to be ordinary It's the doctrine of the resurrection from the dead that brings you that level of faith and then paul went further to touch on judgment eternal judgment and he told us this is important because we have to be mindful that when our work on earth is over life does not end here there is a white throne and there's also the judgment seat of christ the white throne is condemnation for those who are not perfect and unfortunately only jesus have attained perfection so the way you escape the white throne is to be in christ so that when christ passes through the white throne you will also pass then after the white throne you are also mindful that every work you have done will be judged because eternity is a place where rewards and treasures matter that's why the bible says to lay up treasure in heaven if you think that the good life begins and ends in time you are joking in fact jesus admonishes us that the better place to lay treasure is in heaven not earth and the way you lay treasure in heavens is by good works so it's not enough to say i'm born again so i can do what i want you'll be doomed after you are born again you are expected to do good works so that when christ appears christ will give you reward in eternity paul said this basic understanding is what prepares us to journey into maturity but he didn't stop there in ephesians chapter 4 paul began to teach again from verse 11 and he said in order to perfect the believers even much more he said jesus gave some gifts to the body and he said there were five major giftings that jesus gave to the body number one he said the apostles number two he said the prophets number three he said the evangelists number four he said the pastors and number five he said the teachers and he said it's for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry he now gave us seven levels of maturity that will also attain again after we have passed the basic principles and he now began to outline it for us here and he said number one he said we must come to the unity of the faith so you will come to a level where you no longer see the next person sitting by your side in church as a church member you see that person as one with you that you are both in one family and beyond being in one family that that person is like another part of your of your body the way the hand the right hand is a part of my body the left hand is also a part of my body paul said when you truly begin to mature you will see the next person like a different part of a body that you are also part of so there will be no longer basis for gossip there will be no longer basis for malice there will be no longer basis for competition how crazy are you going to be for your right hand to compete with your left hand how crazy will you be for your hand to be jealous of your leg so when you find believers who are still into gossip malice slandering it means they have not begun to grow 
because they've not understood that we are one body they've not understood the place of the unity of the faith we are one body we have one baptism we have one god in fact we are part of the same body paul said that's the first thing you will learn if you start ascending the cadre of maturity he now went to the second he said you will come to the knowledge of the son of god for many people jesus is an ideology it's what the pastor told them that they know about him it's what somebody said that they know about him they've never encountered him but you see when you start growing in the kingdom and you genuinely begin to grow beyond what a pastor told you beyond what you read in a book you too must encounter jesus in first john chapter 1 verse 1 he said that which was from the beginning which we have heard which we have seen which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life he said that is what we have committed to you so everybody who heard everybody who saw everybody who looked upon must also handle so if you don't handle you will not have the experiential knowledge of god so paul saying he's saying the second level of maturity is to actually know jesus personally as an experience and i can tell you if you have not encountered him he is yet an ideology to you you can say a lot of things about him but you don't know him to know him you must experience him and paul is saying that's the second level of maturity he now went to the third level he said until we come to a perfect man and i have shown you what it means to be a perfect man in this context i said to be a perfect man is to have authority over your emotions not to be ruled by your senses because in james chapter 3 verse 2 the bible said see a man that is perfect he said it's a man that has rule over his tongue so you become a perfect man when you have authority over the motions of the flesh but there are many christians today who are still dominated by the flesh even when they are doing what is so-called spiritual all you see is flesh you need to see some people praying you just know that these are carnal men misbehaving on the altar because there's nothing they are doing there that is, sens is, is spiritual it's just sensuality on a rampage either they are showcasing pride or they are showcasing arrogance you can just see it all over meanwhile what they are doing is supposed to be a very spiritual thing but they are not they've not they've not come to that point of a perfect man it's in our generation that somebody will sing a song on prayer and when you hear it your spirit will be offended he's singing about prayer but you you can sense the energy you know that this is from the third dimension this is sensual Be, and because prayer is marketing and marketable anybody who talks about prayer or sing prayer it goes viral and because so many persons are not discerning so long as you say prayer prayer everybody is jumping but for those who are spiritual you hear it and you withdraw you know that no this energy is not of christ because you can feel where it's coming from it's coming from the soul it's coming from sen the sensual realm so paul is telling us that we must come to a point where we master our tendencies we master the impulses of the flesh he said that is a sign that we have become mature and you know the bible said a man who has control over his tongue is stronger than the one who can take a city because if you can't control the motions of the flesh every other thing you do the devil will have a harvest in it you can go and raise the dead and that will be the reason why one thousand ladies will be disflowered because they'll come to you innocently thinking this is a man of god but the wolf in you will come alive because you have not tamed the flesh are you seeing that then paul went further to speak about coming into the measure of the stature of the fullness of christ and i've taught you already that this has to do with the principles of jesus the measure of christ how does christ operate how does christ function if you if you become mature you will no longer live your life based on momentary impulses everything about you will be regimented you will do things the way christ will do them you will not do things just because you want to you will come under the government of the life of jesus so it is the principles of jesus that will power you when you relate with a sister what is the principle that governs that relationship when you handle money what is the principle that governs that money when you are in a position of authority what is the principle that regulates how you handle power because there are many who have not come to this level of maturity they are in church praying fasting and they can join the church for 40 days fasting and prayer until they become senators the moment they win the election the principle that power them is the same principle of egypt and babylon that is powering the children of the world 
so you come you cannot tell the difference between those that are of god and those that are of the world the moment they become governors you can no longer see christ the moment the business begins to do well you can no longer see christ so although they have christian names but they don't have the principles of jesus as touching power as touching relationship as touching resources anytime they handle anything they reflect another spirit other than christ they have not come to maturity he said when we come to maturity we will come to the fullness of the measure of the stature of christ that means our life will have a boundary the boundary of our lives will be the principles that regulated jesus and he didn't stop there he now went to the fifth level and he said that we know more hence as children being tossed to and fro carried about by every wind of doctrine or the slight of men or the cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive so paul is saying the fifth level of maturity is that you become grounded in doctrine so you don't just follow trend you know the truth because in our generation today when anything begins to rain people follow because they don't even know what the truth is and i've told you before it's one thing to quote scripture it's another thing to understand truth there are different things you see a white light that white light you are seeing constitutes of seven other lights there is the red there is the orange there is the yellow there is the green there is the indigo there is the violet and there is the blue so it's seven lights that combine together to form one this is why when the ray of the sun passes through a cloud that has water it splits into seven colors and you call it rainbow the water is acting as a spectrum that separates the seven colors in the white light into seven colors when you are quoting scriptures it's like calling everything about light green or red until you can trace those seven colors and have white light you don't know light so paul is saying we should understand the truth and the balance of doctrine and we understand it so much so that we build discernment from doctrine so that when somebody is talking by scripture we can tell if it's a lie so as i am now there is nothing you can preach that will make me stand up and give money if you like tell me an angel is standing here i know more than that there is nothing you can say that can lure me i know biblically what a man should do or should know or the posture he should assume to give when i am giving i'm giving for three reasons number one because the holy ghost in me prompts me to give number two because i have a revelation of scripture on the subject of giving or number three because i sense a responsibility as a son not because i'm being cajoled into it but responsibility propels me to do it it's not because you can't come and say give you can't lure me i know more than that but there are many who have not yet been established in doctrine so one day you speak they're on fire another day they are cool they fluctuate so they wait for sweet things they respond to sweet things those are the kind of people that become victims of the doctrines of devils because they will heap onto themselves teachers that say sweet things a sweet things they want to hear when you say the truth they can't handle it but paul is saying that for us we must endure sound doctrine because sound doctrine can encourage and it can also chastise but inside the message you can tell that this is christ so number five he said we should understand truth doctrine until we build discernment from doctrine so much so that no cunning person can toss us to and fro and then number six he said we should speak the truth in love that means we come to a point where the totality of our being is regulated by love everything you see us doing is love motivated when we go out to win souls we are not going to prove a point that we are doing well it is love that is motivating us when you see us in prayer we are not praying to show that we are warriors on the altar it's love that is motivating us when you see us show kindness to the helpless it's not because we are looking for human applause it's love that is motivating us when we are worshiping god and you see us lift our hands we are crying or we are preaching with passion it's love that is motivating us there's nothing external motivating us every motivation comes from the nature of christ that is growing on our knees on our knees on our inside paul said when you get there you are truly mature there are many places in the body of christ today somebody can stand up and give 10 million so that they will call his name and people will clap for him but as he's walking home 
somebody else needs 2,000 to eat food he won't give him so that thing he did here is a show there's no love of Christ in him he's just doing it and the day you stop clapping for people he will stop giving so in order to keep him giving the applause and the ovation must be greater every year <laughs> there's no love I'm not saying people should not be encouraged in fact when people do well they should be encouraged they should be motivated to do more but I'm saying sometimes it's manipulation and you can see through it it's not love that motivates them Paul said if we are still sensual people motivated by external things he said we are not growing he said we must come to a point where love propels our actions and then finally he said we grow into him in all things that means in all things we become like christ so that when you see us you see christ when you touch us you touch christ that's why paul speaking in first corinthians 11 verse 1 he said be a followers of me as i am the follower of christ so when you see me you have seen him when you touch me you have touched him so you will grow from unity to knowledge to principles to doctrine to love until a point come when you appear it looks like jesus has appeared so that when we go out we will not go out as church members we will go out as representatives of jesus to our generation that was how they appeared in antioch and that was why they started calling them christians in antioch not because of denomination they didn't know any denomination and i'm not saying denominations are bad but i'm saying that they called them christians in antioch because they looked like christ so they called them little christ but in our generation today even if somebody said it's christ you'll be careful in fact go to somebody's office and say brother this or pastor the colleagues will turn and say pa is this person a pastor you will now hear wonders shall never end they will stop there if you have understanding you will read it is this a pastor wonders shall never end <laughs> the brother will tell you let's leave the office it's hot let's sit somewhere outside <laughs> because they go caricature in church they it don't it won't work there because they are many are fake so paul is teaching us and admonishing us that we must come to maturity this is the journey of the of the christian man this is the journey of the christian woman growing into maturity every other thing finds expression as you begin to grow and tonight i just want to show you five three responsibilities there are many but i pick three three responsibilities that a christian who is genuine and growing will pattern his life after because it's easy to call yourself a christian but it takes grace to live like one anybody can say he's a christian but to live like one will take a lot of grace before we ask for the grace let's find out the life and the responsibility that god expects of one who calls himself a christian number one is prayer i always love to begin with prayer because you will hardly get it wrong if you start with prayer jesus began with prayer and he ended on the cross with prayer if you start with prayer it will be difficult for you to fail it will be difficult for you to miss it so when a, a believer begins to mature and if you find a believer who is genuine one thing you will find in his life is prayer this is why we no longer call it prayer point we call it prayer life because when you truly are a christian it will be difficult to do without prayer trust me find any man who doesn't have a prayer life to a very large extent his christianity is fake because anything can pull him down when a man is burning for god one of the signs you will see in him is the sign of prayer and when a man begins to fall in grace the first sign you will notice is that prayer will be withdrawn because one of the greatest indicators and parameters that shows that your life is being lived for god is that that life will be spent praying 
this is one way you'll find genuine Christian. If you meet anybody, no matter what he's telling you, if you can't see prayer, please be careful. Because this thing is not just about a religious ritual. It's the wooing of the spirit. When a man loves God, when a man is genuine, the Holy Ghost draws him. He cannot stay without communing with the Holy Spirit. So prayer for him is not what Christians do. Prayer for him is like breathing. Because every day, every hour, the Holy Ghost will keep drawing him. Because anything you love and anything your heart is connected to, we draw you. And so when you find a Christian who is given to prayer, know that beyond what you are seeing, there is a force on his inside that keeps pulling him to the altar. The guy was talking in Songs of Solomon, chapter 1, verse 1. And he said to kiss us. Go to verse 2. He said, let him kiss us or kiss me. This person, by the way, there's actually no us in this equation. It's a deep-seated reality of the soul. He said, kiss me with the kisses of, thy, of, his, of his mouth. He said, for thy love is better than wine. So what is projecting the guy to pray is a, a deep-seated intercourse and intimacy. It's the love that he has experienced from his king that draws him. He didn't say because you promised something. He didn't say because I want to make impression. He said the reason I keep demanding. And the word kiss there is not a sensual expression. It's talking about passion. Inflame us with thy fires. Because your love is better than wine. And he went further in verse 3. See what the guy said. See when you see people who have been baptized with prayer. They cannot but eulogize God. Because they are touching the fragrances of the most high. He said, because of the savour of thy good ointment. He said, thy name is as ointment poured forth. He said, the name of God to him is like a man is standing and you open a drum of perfume. And you are just pouring it. So it's the way the fragrance oses out of the perfume. He said, that's how when you say Jesus to him. Jesus is not a religious name. Jesus is like many drums of perfume poured forth. So when he hears Jesus, his soul lives for joy. When he hears Abba Father, his soul is excited. When he hears anything about God, stares him. And so he cannot go a moment without prayer. Because as he's walking in the market, he remembers God. Something, the thing awakens him. It's like passion. Passion is deeper than the passion you have for a woman. When he hears about power, he hears about anointing, he hears about miracles, he hears about mercy, he hears about Jehovah. Something wakes up on his inside. So he doesn't remember that he's in the market. He doesn't remember that he's in the office. As far as he's concerned, anything about God is fragrance to him. And you must respond. If 10 people pass by you and they carry some strong colognes, you know that you must talk. The thing has a way of getting your attention. So the way the spiritual man, his attention is gotten, is by releasing prayer. So when God rises on his inside, ka, 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 and the tongue is a function of the dimension of intimacy that is felt. It's not something you repeat. Even if he's praying with his understanding, the thing is a fountain. Abba Father, the one who dwells in light, the one that created the cosmos, the king over the heavens, the one that rides upon the cloud. Oh, thou majesty. Go and read the Psalms and see what prayer is. It's, it's a love story. It's, it's intercourse. It's intimacy that is beyond human comprehension. So a man stands up and he said, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me. Oh, the days of my life and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever he, that, that is he's an intercourse he's lost imagine how many those of you who understand English language see figures of speech see idiomatic expression see the things the guy was pulling 
He called him Lord. He called him Shepherd. He called him Soul Restorer. He called him his protector. He called him his anointer. Why are you getting those inspirations? Because thy name is like the ointment poured forth. So you cannot but respond with eulogies. You cannot but respond with a, 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 a response of prayer. 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 Oh my God. No wonder the apostle said in Acts chapter 6 verse 4. We cannot do any other thing. Prayer has damaged us. When we encounter this God, something came alive on our inside. So even when we are in the market, our thoughts are on him. When we are on the job, our thoughts are on him. So they said the only thing we can do is to give ourselves to prayer. To prayer and to the ministry of the world. We are drunk with this God. In fact, a point came. Paul said to the church in Thessalonica. In 1 Thessalonica chapter 5 verse 17. He said, pray without ceasing. This thing is not about prayer point. This thing is not about prayer time. It's a river that flows endlessly. Endlessly. Because sometimes you stop praying on your lips. Your heart takes over. You thought you left the prayer altar. Mandarakabakata. You have prayed for 10 hours. As you now close your mouth, your song, now your heart now begins. Mandiaka, Kekira. You are hearing it until it becomes too loud. You have to add your voice again. As you stop, your heart takes over. And then sometimes when you are done talking, then the heart begins to chant. Ah, 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 ah,